if psychology and pop culture had a baby, they'd call it Shrink Tank. You know, there is a sort of pendulum that's swinging back and forth where we kind of go from one extreme. And I think there's an element of truth to Because this. I have something interesting later in the show that will make you feel very weird. From Nashville and Charlotte, this is the Shrink Tank Podcast. And welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dave Verhagen in Nashville. We have a great show for you. Our trending topic today is the psychology of Michael Jackson and leaving Neverland. It's first of a two-part series for our podcast. But first, we're going to meet our Charlotte panel. Dr. Emma Kate Wright is here. Emma Kate, when you were growing up, were you a fan of Michael Jackson? Yes, he was probably the first artist that I would say I was genuinely obsessed with their music outside of TLC, which is a very different genre. <laughs> so. so it was Michael Jackson and TLC. Correct. The big two. And Mariah Carey. Oh, yeah. Yes, those are the three. Got it. Keep going. Keep going. How many more? No, we're good. <laughs> and Dr. Frank Gaskell's with us. Frank, were you a fan of Michael Jackson growing up? I was actually a huge fan of Michael Jackson. Um, Number one, because when we would go to roller skate birthday parties, uh, if you couldn't skate with somebody, you'd have to backward skate. So I would backward skate to Michael Jackson music. And even as recently as the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack, it's, it's just his music was always timeless for me, especially his videos. They were amazing. And Jonathan Hederle is here. He's our certified Asian who rounds out the panel. And Jonathan, I think I know the answer to this one already. You were a big Michael Jackson fan. I've never heard of him. I'm sorry. <laughs> who are we talking about? No, I was a huge Michael Jackson fan. I, when Thriller came out, I actually, in the first grade, won a Michael Jackson dance contest. So <laughs> a little bit of uh, kind of nostalgia watching some of the documentary. I actually cheated at a contest and won tickets to go see the Jackson Victory Tour in Vancouver, Washington. Or, excuse me, Vancouver, British Columbia by stuffing a Pizza Hut contest box. And just, I probably put in like 30 entries in the course of one meal. Uh, I had the the iconic beat it zipper jacket. I would walk around with a wow. sequence glove. My, oh my mom God. would special order cassettes of his back Jackson 5 catalog and what? his early teen solo albums. I had all of his music. Huh. Michael so, Jackson super uh, fan. I yes. was a casual fan, you might say. <laughs> a little bit. Well, we're going to talk more about the psychology of Michael Jackson in the second segment. But first, Jonathan trolls around the Internet each week, and he finds a great story for us of psychology in the news for our first segment that we call Being Human. Well, this research feels a little bit timely with what we're going to talk about, but I'm really going to first and foremost direct this towards Frank. Frank. Did you know that a new study out of Harvard has found that people who had loving parents in childhood have better lives later on? <laughs> Parental warmth impacts well-being and health years later. So the study looked at parental warmth in childhood and looked at um, how well people were flourishing. And what did they mean by flourishing? Well, they talked about happiness and life satisfaction, physical and mental health meaning and purpose, good character, and good relationships in the social dimension. When we are flourishing, we have it all. So, Frank, I want to get your thoughts on this very controversial study about parental love goes a long way to happiness in adulthood. Well, I detect uh, just dripping sarcasm from you. Um, Pretty, pretty sure on that one, but I would say that this research is grounded securely in already established research of attachment theory. And if you are securely attached, you build this internal working model that says you are good, the world is good, you have a healthy locus of control, and if that is laid down early in childhood, say at least by age of two, then things work out pretty well for most people. 
And, and that's I, about all I'm going to say about well, that. No, Frank, what happens if you don't have that? What, 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 what would okay. we look for for someone yeah. that didn't have that parental? Well, the converse, yeah. the converse would be um, an internal working model that says, I am bad and the world is bad. And if I am bad and the world is bad, then you're left with options to either have cognitive control over the world or affective control over the world. And both of those can harm relationships but can make you actually pretty funny, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a laughing matter. Just a yeah. little. <laughs> Tragic comedy. So, uh, Frank, uh, you use the term working model, which is all the unconscious assumptions about how you are, how other people are, how the world operates. It's kind of the operating system that people uh, develop very early on that guides how they take in information, how they feel about themselves, how they relate, all that. Do you think a working model can change? Yes. I do believe a working model can be altered, but it's hard to change that motherboard out. <laughs> just uh, saying. Look at that joke. Look at that joke. So I'm going to add to this where really what happens is we develop implicit memories, which are things that we aren't thinking about consciously. We don't actively think about how to ride a bike. But if you can connect and make those memories become explicit, then there is a way to essentially – change how we view things so and, and this is a whole nother story but we actually might even talk about this when we talk about michael jackson and relationship to trauma because we know frank has lots of trauma in his life what and so you know when we but but i'm serious that so this is a, a strategy and it's essentially connecting the left and the right hemisphere of the brain and we'll we'll probably talk about that later well, if you have questions or comments about this, you can write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. And we're going to move on to our trending topic today, which is Leaving Neverland, the HBO special on Michael Jackson and two of his accusers who accused him of sexually abusing them. It was a special that aired very recently on HBO. It was originally shown at the Sundance Film Festival and basically at the height of his stardom, Jackson began this long-running relationship with at least two boys. That's not in dispute that he had a relationship with them. They were seven and ten at the time. He also developed relationships with their families. And now they're in their 30s, and they are telling their story in this documentary of how they were sexually abused by Michael Jackson and how they came to terms with it years later. The filmmaker makes it very clear that this is not a movie about Michael Jackson. It's a movie about the, these two men and their stories. And we agree with that, but there is a ton of stuff to cover here. So we decided to cover it in two parts. The first part, we're going to delve into the psychology of Michael Jackson a little bit. And then the second part in next week's podcast, we're going to talk about the documentary and trauma and the stories of these two men. So we're going to get into um, Michael Jackson's psychology. Again, anytime we talk about a famous person and psychology, we understand that some of it's speculative. Some of it is just taking information that we're seeing through a certain lens. But there is a lot of information out there that we can kind of glean from all the things that we know about about him, his childhood, the impact of celebrity on him, and so on. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to dive into that today. So let's start with his own childhood and his experience growing up. And we'll start with Jonathan, since you were the super fan. You know everything about Michael Jackson. Tell us about what we all know that he had a troubled childhood. Give us some specifics about that. Well, he comes from a large family, grew up in Gary, Indiana, and it was very much a showbiz family, uh, came from a very strict uh, Jehovah's Witness practicing family. So, And th we don't want to do religious profiling, but there's a lot of celebrities, including Prince, that have over the years kind of shed light on what type of upbringing uh, and, and worldview that can impart on somebody. And w one of the key things about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they really feel separate from the world, so they're very misunderstood. And in a lot of ways, you block out messages from society and culture that helps you 
sort of establish what is normal, what's normalized versus we're misunderstood, we're different in that regard. There's a lot uh, of history and both speculation and, and a number of family members that have shared uh, physical abuse, like a very abusive childhood and father. And that has to also put a lot of tremendous pressure on Michael because very early on it was clear that he was the financial breadwinner for the entire family. And when, when I say entire family, we're talking about eight or nine or ten children. This is not a small family. When you think about the Jackson Five, and then Randy, their youngest, joined that, and then there's, I believe, three sisters as well. So you're talking a, a, a large family, and a kid before he's even a teenager, he is the, the primary or sole breadwinner for everybody's livelihood. And you could argue that was the case for almost his entire life, for the entire family, with the exception of a few other Jacksons that carved out their own moderately successful careers. I would say Janet is the only one that came close to anywhere near, like, super successful superstar. The rest of them had really modest careers apart from Michael Jackson. So given what uh, Jonathan's describing and other information you have, Emma Kate, you've got a kid who grows up in a big, big family, perhaps sequestered from the world in many ways, but also thrust in the spotlight very young. And then this overlay of harsh discipline, crossing the line, probably into abuse. What do you think the impact of all that is on any kid, not just Michael Jackson, but just any kid's development? What does that look like from a psychological standpoint? There's so many things that could go on there, honestly. Um, for Michael Jackson to kind of frame it from his perspective, being in the limelight, being a celebrity, you are constantly criticized or scrutinized. And I think the pressure from the family was a huge factor with this. But it's very obvious that Michael Jackson developed some sort of body dysmorphic disorder because of the multiple surgeries he had on his nose uh, to the point where I think it almost collapsed at one point. Um, and then, you know, the, the skin lightening or maybe vitiligo, we don't know. But regardless, um, it definitely shapes how he views himself because of all the feedback he's getting from the outside world and then probably a lot of negative feedback he's getting from his family. So there's no sense of safety. So you use the term body dysmorphic disorder. What is that? So... Essentially, it's when you create a really distorted picture of what you actually look like. So I have worked with clients where I would put down a whole sheet of paper and I would have them essentially try to draw what they view their body to look like. And then I would have them lay down on top of the sheet of paper and actually trace their body to show how vastly different their perception of what they look like actually is. So what they see in the mirror is not what's actually occurring in reality. Got it. Frank, do you have other insights about what kind of uh, impact this would have, this kind of background would have on any kid? Well, it's interesting going into this documentary because I have sort of set my mind on thinking Michael Jackson is developmentally arrested at a certain age. So that means... A, a traumatic moment or a period of trauma in his life got him stuck at a certain age. And I've always sort of thought of that age as anywhere from 7 to 10. And if you look at his interests and how he looks at Neverland and animals and just sort of who he is, he felt like a child to me. And that, I mean, that coupled with abuse and pressure and all the other things that were going on in his life, I thought, okay, he didn't have a childhood, so now he's going to play with a bunch of kids. And I didn't dig into it a whole much further than that until I saw this documentary. And now I'm completely freaked out. Completely. Why? Tell me why you're freaked out. Well, I mean, I, he's a pedophile, number one. And he's a pedophile with resources. So if, if you get a typical pedophile, doesn't have a lot of money, goes and gets candy and says, hey, kid, here's some candy. That's one thing. Versus, hey, I'm going to let you fill up shopping carts with toys. I'm going to give your parents a special experience. You're going to have a zoo. All this stuff 
there's not a seven-year-old in their right mind that's not going to do that. But this is maybe going a little too far. Not only did Michael groom the kids, he groomed the families. And that's that's the most disturbing part of this for me. But jumping a little bit into that, isn't that usually how it is when a person is going to, a familiar person is going to engage in a inappropriate sexual relationship, a sexually abusive relationship, it usually involves not just working the kid and manipulating and exploiting, but also gaining trust with the family, becoming a, a trusted and special person with the parents. That's usually part of the gig. Well, and that's what's so crazy about it. And, and even in our today, we have social media. We feel like we know these celebrities and are connected with them. These families didn't know Michael Jackson other than, wow, he's this super rock star with this image of him being this awesome guy. So they just walk in already assuming that. And then their confirmation bias, I think, just says, OK, well, yeah, that fits. He's going to take my kid for a week. Well, and part of the grooming, and this is mentioned in the docu- either in the documentary or in the Oprah Winfrey special that's also on HBO was um, all of his charity work, all of his outreach, um, all of his humanitarian, altruistic. There's an element of grooming in a part of that because it creates this social buffer where people look at Michael and say, um, he would never, he would never harm a kid. He would never have anything but loving and altruistic and caring motives about anybody. And we see that with a lot of people in power, whether it be religious or political or what um, Frank talked about earlier with money is like you, you set up this infrastructure that accommodates uh, power and control and abuse. And that's really the difference between a one-time offender who can't groom a a family, can't kind of seize control over uh, an entire family and caretakers and guardians versus somebody who's able to be a serial offender, a serial abuser. You can only do that if the family, the parents are like, this, there's nothing wrong. This person is looking out for my kid. There's another piece of the documentary that really stood out for me. and I, It's almost like I have to split Michael Jackson's life into two. So where you have this little boy that I just really feel badly for and was put in such a horrific circumstance. And then I separate that from Michael Jackson, the adult, whom I now consider a, a monster of biblical proportions. But in reading all the faxes that he would send one of the kids and reading his letters and the wedding ceremony and I love you and here's the ring, there's this pitiful part, really pitiful, that he thinks that's love. I really do think he thought it was love. Mm -hmm. And it's disgusting and pitiful and it destroyed so many families, but you can see how that's rooted in this early childhood trauma that he went through. Yeah, I'm in agreement with that. I don't think he, it's almost like he had a certain level of understanding of what love looks like or maybe what caring looks like, but that sort of unconditional trust, he never was able to establish that in his childhood. So he didn't have any frame of reference and that kind of was this guiding force for him and, you know, not knowing how to handle different emotions and and all sorts of things. Frank used the term that he's a monster, and I want to get to that in a bit because I I think what we want to get to is how do we understand this guy psychologically and what's some of the nuance of that. But Jonathan, do you have any more insight about how his early years, his upbringing shaped the person that he became? Well, I do think, and we've touched on this a lot, he didn't have a lot of just normal social interaction with his peers. He was very insulated either in celebrity culture, which is performing, and really it's performing to adults. We've kind of learned over the years that being a childhood celebrity or entertainer, it it is just very ripe for abuse, neglect, all types of psychological damage and trauma. The idea of like... You're entertaining people, and that's really how you secure love and affection and warmth. So the only other kids he really hung out with was with other celebrity kids. And you think about 
over time, even as he got older, like he would gravitate towards Macaulay Culkin. He would gravitate towards um, Corey Feldman. Later on, he, he's he's talking to Wade about his affiliation with Britney Spears, Spears, these young celebrities. And I just don't think Michael ever had any framework for what normal, out of the spotlight, someone seeing him just as a person, as a kid, as a teen, as an adult. There was always these layers of how he was viewed, um, both in his mind and in reality. You can't meet the king of pop and not be like, this is the biggest global superstar of his era and not have it impact how you treat him. Well, we don't know that his early childhood had an impact on his later behavior, particularly the relationships with children, the grooming of kids, things like that. But this may be a very obvious question, or it may not be. You you have eight or nine other siblings who are raised in the same family, and there's no um, indication that Jermaine or Tito or any of the others had this arrested childhood that they had this fascination with children, that they've acted inappropriately. There's never been any, to my knowledge, even hint of that. So why is that? What, what, how, how would we make sense of same family, same experiences for the most part, although maybe a little bit different, maybe a lot different in terms of celebrity? What's, how do we make sense of that? I think when I think about that, I, I think it goes back to the kind of parent-child dyad where – his parents knew, as Hederly said, he was going to be the breadwinner for everyone. And so he was this immensely talented, cute, bubbly kid. I remember watching some of the earlier performances with the Jackson 5 and just how infectious his onstage presence was. Um, and so for him, it was almost as though dad and mom put all the pressure on on him to, to make it work. You have to be successful. This is the only way. And I couldn't fathom that level of intensity coming from a parent who's supposed to be giving you unconditional love at a young age. I want to throw a little bit different slant. So if we look at it from attachment theory, one of the things that you see, uh, with people who struggle with attachment is they, they're they either super disconnected or they're seeking affection. They can be hypersexual. And if my memory serves, let, let's just pretend you've got all these kids. Well, the further on down the line, <laughs> I mean, kids are taking kids and, and it, it's not like, oh, this is my first child, this is my second child. And I think if you look at the sexuality part, it's, it's, it's almost like it's a part of him trying to seek affection and seek love and seek acceptance. And LaToya and Janet, they're in that same boat with their surgeries, being in uh, Playboy magazines, all their relationships. That, that, that It still sort of fits for me that there's that theme. I don't know enough about the older ones. So, Dave, I think you made a comment earlier that we're not sure whether or not his early childhood experiences shaped and influenced his later actions. There's a part of me, though, that maybe disagrees with that, because when we experience trauma, it literally becomes a landmine in our brain, and it does get encoded physiologically. Um, I mentioned this idea of implicit memories. So implicit memories, again, are things that you aren't actively aware of that you're recalling. And for infants, I think you actually start to encode around like 18 months even. Like you don't actually have explicit, which is – so an explicit memory is a true memory when you think about an event in your life. Um, you recall an explicit memory as opposed to sensory stuff. So kids um, who are infants, babies, are thinking about the feel of their parents, the smell of breast milk, those sorts of sensory-based perceptions. And when we have unsafe information that comes, it does get encoded as implicit. And I, I know this is a little convoluted, so I'm going to try to explain it as easily as I can. But if you have implicit memories that are being drawn upon through new experiences because we use new we use old information to process any new experience that we have regardless of our awareness of it so he's been using whatever happened from his early childhood 
without maybe awareness to guide and shape his future actions. And and again, there's a whole this is a whole nother thing we could go into, but there's so much about the brain and then a connection with trauma and how it shapes and influences our stress response and how we engage with things. Now, let's say that comment you make about birthday 18. I mean, obviously, there's no way to know this for sure, but if you got eight or nine kids and then you got another one and you're performing and you're busy and there's music, like I, I would be curious about how much Michael got consistent attention from one particular caregiver or was it just sort of passed around? What was he exposed to? I, 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 I think there's a lot going on between zero and four with him. Very Well, and we know... F- I'm sorry, Dave. Well, I was going to um, say it very much could be... But I, I, I want to make this point that I'm not doubting that um, problems with attachment cause trouble later in life, that trauma causes trouble later in life. What I'm really trying to get at, let's let's say that we believe these accusers and that that what they are alleging is true. Is it possible that it isn't the product of attachment problems, trauma that, you know, you have sometimes you have experiences of kids that the way that their brains are wired, they, they are inclined to a whole range of things. And that, that, is it possible that, that we're making this connection between these things and this certain pattern of behavior with kids? It, It seems likely, but is it possible that it would have turned out that way if his home life was very loving and very nurturing. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So I will go back to me believing Michael Jackson was developmentally arrested at age seven. And I'm going to take facts that, well, he's got kids in his bed. Well, he's got that. Oh, well, you know. And I just push that away because I want to hold on to this belief. And it's Occam's razor. If he looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's probably a duck. That's what I'm going with with Michael Jackson. It's it's the most it's, straightforward it's the so explanation. Simplest. Yes. Yes, but I I do see kind of what you're saying, Dave, in terms of what was the driving force behind him developing into, as Frank said, this monster. Because it it could be theoretically in our brains we have reward circuitry, and maybe he had some sort of weird experience, a sexual experience. Um, exposed to a child while he was aroused and then that slowly over time developed into something more we i mean it's hard to say for sure yeah and i think it's very important for our listeners to understand that many many people are exposed to trauma in childhood and they do not they do not develop right. any type of inappropriate sexual patterns right. or abuse. And so it is important to highlight that all of this is speculative. The, the whole documentary is speculative, even if if Frank and, and others, we kind of say, well, the the most sensible conclusion from all of this, all of this smoke is that there's a fire there. Um, but I, I do think one of the things that with most crimes is, is, is a catalyst, whether it's the root cause or it, it's what um, tips the iceberg into taking activity is just opportunity. He had opportunity. He had access to little children. He had created his own private, you know, um, Shangri-La, this utopia that was very uh, secure uh, from other people. He created, whether it was grooming or just uh, just kind of passive trust uh, from parents and others, and and that greatly contributed to the acts. And it was also magnified for me because, I mean, I I do think he he thought like a child, for sure, and that's why he built a lot of that stuff. But the thing that just made my skin crawl is the hideout in Westwood, where he had this hidden space where he would take one kid at a time with the parents in the other room, and it, it, it's, it's almost like having a well in your basement. It's just scary. So Frank said earlier that after watching this, he comes to the conclusion that this guy's a monster, and there's really three possibilities. One possibility is that he is a monster, and all the other things that made him look 
altruistic and good were there for ulterior motives and were, were, were not really pure. The second possibility is that this, these allegations aren't true and he is as he has appeared in the public eye. And the third possibility is that both things can be true, that he can be a person who's done some horrible things and has really hurt a lot of people and also had a side of him that wanted to do good, wanted to show love, wanted to be altruistic. What's your take on how to understand this guy? I'm, I'm in the middle. However, when I look at what he did to these kids and what I would imagine many other kids it it's it's just i don't know it's just horrific to me and it, it it it's i can sit here logically and think all right well you know he was created in this way and he he wanted to do some good things and sure he did some good things um but then i'm i'm just left with the horror of of what actually happened and it's hard for me to look at the good so i think what frank just described is something that was really nicely talked about in the Oprah Winfrey after special with the two individuals and the director of the documentary, where it's a paradox. You can't wrap your head around the fact that somebody can be truly bad, but also have done good things. And it's, and it's extremely confusing. And you see a lot of Michael Jackson fans online that are just refusing to even acknowledge the documentary, refusing to watch it, uh, attacking uh, everybody that's involved in the documentary. I mean, and I think of, you know, cognitive dissonance, like this this unwillingness or inability to take this new information and data and to be able to synthesize or integrate it with their very rigid and established image of Michael Jackson and what he means to them. That's That's the easiest route. The easiest route is to have a very simple, he's either all good or he's pure evil versus what we know is anybody is capable of both. And more often than not, we're a byproduct of our morals and our decisions. And that's part of uh, why I brought it up is because it feels like we're in an increasingly polarized culture. And we do that with, with you know, people that are on all levels of the political spectrum or all levels of difference. But we, I mean, obviously when, when someone does something really horrible and child sexual abuse is about as bad as you could do. Um, it's easy to think of that person as a horrible person, but yet it does seem like both things exist in the same guy. And that's just harder to hold in your head. It's harder to hold all that in your head and to say, this guy might have done some good things and might have been good hearted in many ways. And also did some very, not just made mistakes, but did some very deliberately horrible things that, that are, are monstrous. That's, that's hard to kind of wrap your head around. Mm-hmm. It is. When Jonathan was talking about the, the fans on social media, it, it, it feels like people came at this already having made their minds up. And the people that are his diehard fans are going to, you know, they're going to stick with him. They're going to, they're going to champion him and others who've been inclined to believe that he was a pedophile or child abuser are already there. Do you think this documentary helps us move the needle a little bit in any direction with this? Do you think it it helps us um, think about this differently? It, It did for me. You know, I, I remember when we were talking about this as a podcast and planning for it, and I said to you, Dave, eh, he's just a developmentally, developmentally arrested at age seven. And you said, yeah, you might feel a little differently. Yeah. And I feel completely different. Well, you know, and I remember I, – so I watched the documentary, the part one, as it aired and immediately got on Twitter after just to see what was going on. And it was – intense what people were saying but it was also interesting because then there started to be a slow trickle where individuals were essentially oh okay this this is a lot different than what i expected and then the second part when part two came out the second night 
it was very clear that the trend was not as polarized and people were in agreement, okay, something for sure happened. Right. Yeah, the uh, director, I believe his name is Dan Reed. I apologize if I'm, I'm misspeaking. When they originally uh, premiered this at Sundance, was that correct, Dave? That's correct. He and the two victims, they were going into that very worried. They uh, they came into it with the mindset like this, we're going to get a lot of pushback People are going to accuse us of being opportunistic. And they were actually very, very shocked by how well-received and warm the response was at Sundance and how much people really, when they heard the, the, them recount the abuse, when it, when it wasn't just headlines or it wasn't just an adult that they didn't know, but talking through the grooming, the the cover up, the control, the fear, it made it very real to people. And I think that's one of the key things we're learning about, um, you know, uh, crimes and and abuse. Like we think about it even within the NFL. It's like we hear stories of of players abusing or mistreating women, but when there's a video and you see it, people have a immensely different response to it. And so to have four hours and to have two men and their families tell the story of what happened from their account, it is immensely powerful. We are wired for storytelling. And that's really what this documentary is, telling the story. And that's a good lead into our second part that we'll get to next week. But if you have questions or comments, we want you to write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. And we'd love to hear from you. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Shrink Tank Podcast. We hope you'll check out shrinktank.com for great articles and videos. We also hope you'll follow us on Twitter at shrink underscore tank and like us on Facebook. For questions or comments, please drop us a note. Our email is feedback at shrinktank.com. And if you like the show, give us a review on iTunes. This really helps us build our audience, and we greatly appreciate it. Our producer and theme music composer is Sean Beck. Our associate producer and social media guru is Mariel Butler. For Emma Kate Wright, Jonathan Hederley, and Frank Gaskell in Charlotte, I'm Dave Verhagen in Nashville. Tell all your friends about us and make it a great week. Okay.